Um, my name is Roxanne Swensel, or Ojegipovi in my language, uh, meaning frost flower. That tells you that I was born in the winter. <laughs> okay, um, Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute was established as a nonprofit in 1989. We've been playing around ever since then with ideals of permaculture, but permaculture um, in particularly in context of uh, Pueblo tribal communities. This is my home I built in, um, well, in the early 80s. Um, it's a passive solar adobe house. At the time, it was a driveway, and there wasn't a single plant um, in the area. And since then, it has turned into quite a forest. Uh, but for seven years, we lived sustainably right on this site with no electricity and growing most of our food and what we needed on an eighth of an acre piece of property. I still live there today. So um, in context, I, I come from uh, a long lineage of uh, Pueblo uh, Indians who were the Anasazi peoples of the uh, Four Corners region. Uh, we can even date our, um, follow our history back to the exact tribe Pueblo site in Mesa Verde area. Um, we are community-based community people, so we learned how to survive in the high desert by working together in a community. And I thought that was really important to come here to Akosanti because it's a community-minded um, adventure here. And so I thought, well, you know, that's perfect because we are too. We're, we started off that way. And um, we still are community-based people, although with Western ideals, we've broken up quite a bit. But as you can see in our beginnings, we're very community-based. Everything is connected. So with that in mind, that community in mind, we're thinking of family. We're all family. So it's not just um, you know, your mom and dad and your kids and your aunties and uncles, but it's the plants and animals and all of the beings that you are living amongst. That's how we, in, that's how we are seeing community and family. And the whole point of permaculture is where do you fit in and how do everything fit together in order to make it a sustainable and life-giving um, adventure. So one of the main principles in um, Pueblo thinking is this reciprocity. So nothing is given out without something coming back. And it's based on breathing. <laughs> Literally to have life means you take in and you let out. So you're always you know, receiving the gifts around you, but you don't just keep breathing in. You don't be greedy. <laughs> you have to <sighs> release again. So with that thinking as a basic understanding of life, um, you live according to that. <laughs> or you die. <laughs> it's that simple. So uh, we also see the family in many kinds of um, ways and patterns. Um, I love using this basket because I always think of every strand of the basket being pieces of the community, whether it's you or your bathroom or your, your neighbor's horse or whatever. It's all interacting with each other. And the diversity of a community makes the basket either weak or strong. So if you wanted a strong basket that isn't going to fall apart with the first um, uh, plague or whatever, uh, you want a lot of diversity within your community structure. And it will make that basket strong. Isn't that cool? <laughs> okay, a lot of um, permaculture for me has been the pattern understanding. And patterning understanding um, is seen everywhere if we look. And when I was first learning permaculture, 
I got so excited when I was hearing about the patterning part of it because it resonated with the way I was brought up thinking within my tribal way of thinking. And that is that there's energies moving always. And today the wind is moving and that's an energy. And the seasons, that's an energy. And the way we move through the world and interact with who we interact with is a pattern. And simplified, simplified, um, you'll start to see it in very particular um, patterns, um, designs. And one of the main ones is the spiral. And you can see it from the tiniest things to the biggest things, as you can see in the galaxy or in a growth in a petri dish, or in the way your hair circles the top. Oh, so many, so many spirals. So I love just looking for the patterns around me and the so-called objects that we have that we get focused on sometimes show those patterns, those energies flowing uh, in beautiful, wonderful ways. And you can see it in some of um, these particular pictures. Uh, water is a really good way of uh, seeing the patterns that move. Uh, if you ever drop a uh, pebble in a very still pond and the ripples that go out, they're actually, if you were eye level to that water, it's a, it's a wave pattern. And it goes actually forever. You know, it's just because it hit the banks doesn't mean the energy stopped there. It goes on forever. And what's the, what's the saying that, you know, the wings of a butterfly can be felt on the other side of the universe because of the flutter? The movement of anything is affecting everything. So the lesson there is what we do affects everything. So think about what you do because it matters. Um, more beautiful um, examples of patterning. So like um, if you see the sunflower, I always like uh, thinking about sunflower seeds. If you notice the particular way sunflower seeds are, are shaped and you go, that's a strange seed. But the only reason that it's shaped that way is because of the energy that the sunflower grew in. And if you see the little lines, the circular patterns of the energies um, of the sunflower, the way it grew, that is what is creating the shape of the seed. So instead of looking at objects, think about the patterns or the energies that flow between everything. Um, uh, most indigenous cultures around the world have particular patterns that they're associated with because they were pattern literate people instead of object literate. Now in the Western world, we're very focused on objects, things. Oh, it's that, it's oh, it's that. We forgot to look at what the patterns are that may that be there. Or is it a lack of pattern understanding that it's there? Um, the whole idea is that nature loves patterns. Nature moves within patterns. And if we want to have life go well, you move with the flow <laughs> of these patterns. If you want to struggle and just have a really rough time, you fight against the pattern or the current. Um, and then you have a pretty hard life. Or as we believe in, in our tribe, it's like the way you walk, the way you move through things will determine whether you're flowing with the patterns of nature or not. And interestingly, these patterns can be seen even in destructive forces. This is an amazing pattern of a tree, of a clear, clear cut. And I love that. It still shows. So we can be destructive in our patterns, too. Um, people have used patterning, especially you know, if you look back within uh, indigenous tribes throughout the world, uh, when we were still really uh, connected to nature more. The more connected to nature we were, the more we were using patterns in our designs for our cultural things or whatever we were doing. Uh, it was usually pattern oriented. And the less you see these patterns, the more further from nature we have gotten. 
um, patterns are also very connected to place. Place-based patterns of original peoples uh, tell about that place in particular. So it's not McDonald's. You can't just put it anywhere. <laughs> it's place-based because it matters, because those energies fit those places. I love um, the design on the, the front end loader of the tractor there. I was in Greece, and I thought, somebody took the trouble to weld these patterns on their tractor <laughs> backhoe thing. And I thought, that is wonderful. That's a wonderful example of um, place-based patterning of who they were that mattered to them. Uh, the shells on the, on the gate picture show that they're not from New Mexico, that's for sure. <laughs> they're from a water place. Um, the other ones are actually um, of my place and their patterns and understandings that I understand given where I'm from. Uh, people have used patterning in architecture uh, to make things strong, to make things beautiful, patterns to make things cool or hot, using patterns of seasons, things like that. So we've used patterns all along. Also in um, energy, uh, understanding the patterns of solar helps us to, to do many things, wind, you know, gravity, fire, currents, DNA, cold, hot, electrical, wet, dry, migrations, moods, those are all patterns. And those can all, if you un understand those kind of patterns, you could use them in your system or your design to um, help you out. Here's some nice patterns of um, farming. Um, and they're based on place-based, so they're not just coming in and flattening everything and making it monocropped. They're using that place and what that place has to give in order to um, grow their food. And it becomes beautiful, it's beautiful. Uh, I think the lower left is Africa, the, the right top I think is China, and the other two is my yard. using pattern understanding for companion planting or stacking, pest control, water retention. So these are also pattern understandings to actually understand that things don't grow out in nowhere. They grow within a context. And um, as I always tell people who are about to go plant their first tree or bush or whatever, I go, where would you want to be planted? <laughs> You don't want to be planted right in the middle of a driveway with no protection, it's hot, it's cold, if people run over you. <laughs> you're going to want a nice little nook because you're a baby plant and you need to get stronger. And so you're always looking for those energies that are comforting. Not just for humans, plants like that too. In insects like that too. Everything likes a little bit of comfort, a little bit of nice feeling to it. So, you know, work with that. Um, these are examples of using mulch because we live in the high desert. We have very little water, so the whole uh, saving water keeping it from evaporating or running away is very important to us. In other climates, you may want the water to run away from you because you have too much of it. So you need to consider where you are and the patterns and energies that are within your area. Companion planting. We use a lot of companion planting because um, Nobody likes to be all alone. <laughs> if you have a monocrop of corn or whatever, one insect or one plate comes through, it's just going to wipe it out. You have a variety of many crops growing in one spot, and any pest that comes through has to really struggle to find the next corn, because it has to go through the tomatoes and the squash and all the beans. and you know it. It helps everything, again, be diverse. And so the system becomes stronger and not just one strand of basket.
Flowering tree uses pattern understanding for species selection and place-based knowledge. So given that we are um, in the high desert, um, the plants, the species that have adapted to that location are very important to that location. Um, they grow better. <laughs> they work better together. And as a Pueblo person, they are our relatives. That's how we see them. So especially for corn, we call them, corn is actually considered a grandmother. So you treat her like a very important elder. Um, so all of those things matter. It's not just, oh, put anything anywhere. They're not just objects to put whatever you want. The relationship you have to all these things matters. Yield, yields are greater and healthier following natural patterns than with monocropping. So once again, you get a healthier system when you get a diverse and uh, happy patterned environment. Uh, seeds of our ancestors flowering tree has three seed banks that started. This is um, the one at my house, and we're focused mostly on saving the seeds of our ancestors. I realized that um, when I first started flowering tree, we were losing our crops because people were stopping farming. Um, their Walmart showed, showed up, and it, people were, can go to town to buy whatever. But um, the tomatoes in Walmart and the corn in Walmart are not our native foods here. And, um, and if we didn't grow those foods out, we would lose them. So it became very important to me to start saving our crops, our seeds. Here is my house after about 35 years of growing a food forest in a driveway. Um, it houses uh, lots of things. <laughs> Sometimes I'm surprised what I find in there. Remember, it's an eighth of an acre, so it's not very big, but we have hundreds of things growing in there. And uh, it supplies an immense amount of fruits, vegetables, uh, and not just for humans. It's also for bees and for the, the local dogs and <laughs> whatever else wanders in. So um, it's growing a food forest. Uh, we work with other organizations in the area that have like-mindedness, and that's part of a pattern understanding of putting these things together. So even though flowering tree has many fibers to it, we also are part of a next layer of reaching out and community. Uh, so here are some of the organizations I work with, and we think of it as tying our corn together. We, are, we work together. Uh, one of the organizations honoring our Pueblo existence and the Flowering Tree have done many projects together. We get really down and dirty <laughs> often. And one of the projects we did was to build um, 25 Ornos ovens, adobe ovens for the community. And at the same time teach adobe building because that's our traditional building method. And I love building the Ornos because they're small enough to actually build something and see it finished within a short time. And it also uses pattern understanding in laying bricks because just the way you lay the bricks makes the building stand up and hold itself together because it's an igloo. Here's some of the community building their ovens. <laughs> and some other people plastering, mud plastering. And then we could give these beautiful ovens to different community members that use them for traditional cooking in. And after doing all of that, we realized looking around at our community, we were noticing there's a lot of health issues. So. We ventured on a new project, and it was based on our bad health. <laughs> and tribal people have actually the worst health there is uh, percentage-wise of any racial group in the United States. And it's 
uh, due to our lifestyle, our depression, our abuse, um, both outside and inside inflicted. But it's um, a largely what we put in our bodies matters. So at the time, my son, who was about 30 at the time, maybe 25, 30, uh, had gone to the doctors. The doctors told him um, he was going to have a heart attack if he didn't change something. He was large and um, not doing so well. Uh, he's a historian of the tribe, and we were looking through old tribal photographs, and we were looking at the people, our people. And the further back in history you got in the pictures, the healthier we looked. <laughs> and the closer we got, we looked worse and worse and worse. It's like, what happened to us? Um, basically, we decided it's our lifestyle and what we eat. And so him and me sat down and thought, I wonder if we could eat the way we ate before, in our case, the, Hispanic, the Spanish people had arrived in New Mexico. So a pre-contact Pueblo diet. So we were the first testers to see if we could even do that. And within a month, my son had changed so drastically health-wise, his health had improved, that we um, realized we were onto something really important. Um, this image is an is a image of where I'm from, Santa Clara Pueblo, about 50 years ago. So as a group, we decided to get enough tribal members together that were interested in this um, health thing of eating our ancestral foods and come together, hold hands, and see if we could eat our, our native foods for three months and see what happened to us. So the first things we did was we all went and got uh, blood tests done. So we were going to do this scientifically and <laughs> get prodded and poked and went home from the doctors very depressed with all our health issues. And we had everything that you can think of <laughs> in this group. We had six-year-olds to 65-year-olds in this group. And uh, we had things from depression to diabetes to autoimmune problems to you name it. We had it. And um, then we all uh, decided we're going to eat the foods of our ancestors. We gathered often for potlucks because we needed the, the support of community because it's actually um, a very different way of eating and diet than the American diet is. Here's some examples of the foods. And because we didn't have, we didn't step into it with our ancestors having storage stores of these kinds of foods in the back room or anything, we, a lot of it we had to go looking for. And we all laughed about going to the grocery store and we'd go up and down the rows, up and down the rows, trying to find anything that we could eat. And it was very um, limited, let's say. So we started to have to look outside of the grocery stores for a lot of the foods. And a lot of that became like foraging in the hills and mountains and um, getting in touch with our local hunters to go <laughs> find us some food and um, becoming farmers again because uh, we were farmers originally. And so my seed bank became very valuable all of a sudden because those were the crops and the species of our of our ancestral foods. And then there were some foods that we had lost track of completely and didn't even think of as food anymore, but became part of our diet again, such as grasshoppers and grubs. So it encouraged the farming aspect again of the culture because we couldn't just go buy it at the store. It encouraged growing it out and um, learning how to um, harvest and take care of these plants and what to do with them after you harvest them, how to process all these uh, amazing foods. And the hunting and gathering that came in. Here's um, me and my buddy, Marion. We had uh, harvested a buffalo 
and uh, along the way we collected a turkey as well. So a lot of the local game that we could still find uh, was was brought back in. This buffalo fed the 14 volunteers and their families for a whole year. Amazing, amazing buffalo. Gathering, gathering things in our environment like um, the berries and wild stuff that grows seasonally, um, pinyon nuts and mushrooms and things like that. And it reconnects us again with the seasons because um, when you gather outside in the environment, you have to know what time of year it is in order to know when the wild parsley is coming up, when the wild onions are coming up, when the mushrooms come up. Those get you in touch with the seasonal aspects of your world. Here's a nice picture of our area of women gathering water. I mean, water becomes, where does your water come from? <laughs> it's a relationship again. We, you know, we got so used to going and turning a faucet on, but and it's magic. But before, we knew where our water came from. We didn't just like magically turn a faucet. We like walked over there and saw that it was muddy today, or saw that it was clear today, or saw that it was low or high. Relationships again. One of the big things uh, about this uh, food experience that we went through was. Um, we uh, learned a lot about what our needs were and what we could live without. And one of the big things that was so important to us was salt. <laughs> and I had heard stories about salt mother, salt mother this, salt mother that, and it was they held up, our ancestors held up salt mother so high and I was like, hmm, okay, until we did this diet and then I was like, oh my God. <laughs> salt became very important. And they used to say, you know, the Spanish loved gold, the Pueblos loved salt. That was th how much it was valued. Um, so we went looking for our traditional salt beds that had been lost. Nobody knew where they were anymore because we didn't just go buy it at the store. We used to find it in our environment. And one of the most amazing things that we did during this time was finding our salt beds, our original salt beds again. We went out there and we had ceremony and we sang and we cried and we brought her back. And it was a big, big moment to, to bring this, this salt back from our, from our lives. Um, one of the big differences in food preparation was no frying. We didn't have olive oil. <laughs> we didn't have, you know, deep fried nothing. Um, we relied a lot on boiling and drying stuff. Uh, this also, went, once you like started to do this process, it pulled in, well, what were we boiling our food in? And then it brings back the resurgent of making pots for cooking in not just selling to tourists. <laughs> it was like, wow, we could be useful potters again. So um, we live in a very dry climate, so you know you could dry anything. As you know here, too, it's a very dry climate. We didn't have refrigerators. I lived without a refrigerator. I still don't have a refrigerator um, since, ooh, now it's been about 20 some years, no refrigerator. Um, you can live without a refrigerator. We have lived without refrigerators a long time as human beings. It's been very recently that we have refrigerators. We learned how to store food for thousands of years, all of us. And we just recently lost that knowledge. But we can find it again. Um, you can dry anything. Here's some corn drying, all, um, wild, wild parsley, beans. Well, spinach, some, some pumpkin seeds. Uh, what I also found was really cool was that you can dry uh, summer squash. If you cut it, put a little salt on them, and dry it, they're like a replacement for chips. Uh, here's us roasting chicos, or the sweet corn. You put it in the, in the orno and then you can dry it, and then it'll last about three lifetimes. <laughs> so you can just rehydrate it whenever you want some corn soup. 
Halloween became different. We still had Halloween, but we made it be our kinds of foods. Here's some popcorn and pinions and wild plums and trail mix with pine nuts and currants and little quail eggs. The kids were like, where's the candy? <laughs> <laughs> but the results were really good. Here's um, one of the, the participants, and we had three people who had lost uh, close to 100 pounds during this, and we ate as much as we wanted. Um, every health issue that we had improved. It didn't matter. Um, people that were on depression meds were off of them. People that were on um, uh, you know, diabetes stuff, they, they leveled out. Um, high uh, cholesterol stuff, evened out. It was just across the board, we improved so, so much that it was um, proof that if we um, ate this way, we could improve our health as Native people. And um, doing this project, I realized that as a seed saver, there's one thing that I understood very deeply about these particular seeds I was saying was that they they're place-based plants. So, you know, if I go get Iowa corn and try to grow it in my yard, it probably wouldn't do so well. Um, if I took our corn out to Iowa, it probably wouldn't do so well. It'd be too much water. <laughs> um, I read a scientific article once that said it takes 20 generations of any species, plant, animal, insect, any, any human seed, 20 years of any species staying in one location for the DNA of that species to adapt, to suddenly fit. And I went, wow, that makes a whole lot of sense. Our crops, our species fits our high desert climate so well, that's why it is so important to keep those plants alive for our location. For every location in the world, there's place-based DNA that matches. And you know, in today's world where we you know, travel all over the place and um, I think of it as a jar of water and dirt, it's always shook up. We never get our water to settle. Our mud never settles. <laughs> and I think what happened to us on this Pueblo food experience diet was our mud settled. Even though as Pueblo people, we're one of the luckiest tribes because we were not relocated, so we're still in our homelands that we've been for thousands of years. So that we have in our, in our bucket. But we've been eating for the last you know, 30, 40 years, um, not our original foods. So it's like we've been traveling through Europe and China and Africa and every, my son went to the, you know, the doctor and the nutritionist uh, talked to him and they pulled out the food pyramid chart and he was looking at it, he brought it home and he says, hey mama, look at this chart. I looked at it and he says, they're telling me to eat this pyramid way. Not a single one of these foods is from this continent. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. They're telling us to eat foreign food to be, to be healthy. And we thought, well, what if we ate our food? What would our pyramid tree look like? And um, we, we proved that it did improve our health tremendously. But that um, led to the realization that every person, every one of us is a seed. And our DNA, our genetics, is matched with the last place our DNA was for 20 generations before it moved. So if you think about you know, just your past, your, your cultural heritage in your body, and the place that your body was last time for 20 generations, and the food that existed there, and try to eat that way, I bet your mud would settle too. <laughs> So that's what happened to us. Our mud settled. If we stay on the diet, as soon as you go off of it, our mud gets messy again. So one of the things we did was um, uh, put a cookbook together for our community to help them know what, uh, what to eat to start uh, feeling healthier and getting their mud to settle. Um, this led to more cultural awareness of 
uh, how you deal with these foods because even if you find some of this food here and there, we were, we were continuously evolving backwards kind of, uh, but forward at the same time of going, well, it mattered how we were cooking that food. Suddenly it wasn't just corn we're eating, it's that particular corn. And then it wasn't just that particular corn, it's how that particular corn was processed and treated. And it became this amazing journey. So here we are, uh, Marion and me, we decided we needed a traditional women's uh, house for the community. So what do we do? We start building it <laughs> out of rocks and our dirt. <laughs> and here we are making our adobes for the blocks. And it was all community-based, so whenever we got community workers, there's a bunch of guys that showed up this day and laid some adobes in the mud. And the tribe gave us some vigas from up the canyon, and that determined the size of our house <laughs> because the vigas were that long. And um, there's them cleaning them, getting them ready. Mm. Here's, here's it in the inside. And this community house is for the women to cook and grind the corn. And you could see the, the grinding stones underneath the bench. And so we brought back the old old style grinding of corn. Now that sounds like, oh, why do you want to do that? And realize that it's the most amazing communal activity I have ever been part of. And I've always been part of the tribal um, ceremonies and stuff, but bringing the stones back and, and giving them a house and then having the women come and ceremoniously grind corn together while men come and sing to you. That is pretty neat. Um, it's also just a gathering house for women to come and talk together and um, do things. Uh, we had a group of visiting women from Pakistan and Israel come that were dealing with their long-term um, problems with each other, and they came to our women's house to talk about it and at the same time help. So we had them plastering outside, and it was a very nice um, cultural pulling together of different cultures to find common ground. So inside the house again, this is a, a picture of an old Hopi woman making our old um, kind of cornbread on a hot stone. Here's the stones getting ready to be ground on and uh, the cooking stone area. So to learn how to cook on the stones again is really, really important. And here's a women after a day of making bua, it's the name of our corn bread. They're very happy. We um, taught 70 women uh, last year how to make bua for the first time. Uh, so future projects, what are we doing now? Um, again, back to pattern understanding. <laughs> uh, trying to still put things together. We have new sites, so as my forest at the house continues to grow and produce whatever it does. We have um, new areas to venture out into, and so we're growing a new permaculture site at other sites. Uh, one of these areas is a medicinal garden area for the midwives that are wanting to use the place for birthing and medicines in the natural way. Um, so we made this spiral garden, and we're still working on it uh, to house the medicinal herbs. And uh, we thought this pattern was important to just establish as a reminder to people that the patterns do matter. Here it is being built up. It's beautiful, beautiful artwork. Um, and it's based off of Dr. Masaru Emoto, <laughs> who claimed that the human consciousness, consciousness could affect the molecular structure of water. 
So I love this. When I first saw this, I don't know, 30 years ago, whenever it was, I, it fit because for Pueblo people, as I was saying, we affect everything. So your energy affects everything around you. Um, and this proved it. You know, the water crystal stuff was just like, ah, you know, scientifically shown that it's like, look what it does when you're nasty. <laughs> and look what it does when you're kind. Um, and so the intention behind things really makes a difference. And so to go, we're going to make a, a garden bed of medicine. Wouldn't it, isn't it the right medicine to approach it with thinking those water crystals should start out in a really good way where you don't just go dig a hole and plant a plant in where you make a home that's so beautiful and then you ceremoniously come and put that plant in and you know that that plant's going to have wonderful water crystals that will give you good medicine. The other little um, project we've been working on is a greenhouse, turkey pen, seed bank, beehive. Of course, those have to go together because no greenhouse should not have, <laughs> shouldn't be without a beehive or a turkey pen. Um, so again, it's multi-stacking, multi-purpose to, um, to create a more tight basket. We went through the first winter this year with it and it works beautifully. The seed bank is on the back side. The greenhouse is stabilized. Inside we're starting to grow plants and working with hydroponics, which is just oh, an amazing uh, new gardening skill for me at least. But we've been producing a lot of greens out of that. And the seed bank is uh, being stocked, the new seed bank, but it also promotes the, the Build, making of the containers, so you know we're potters traditionally, so it's encouraging the pottery making in the tribe. And the back of it is the turkey pen, which turkeys are very important to us. They bring us lots of good things, and they're incredible pest control and meat producers and egg producers, and they're very, very much our relatives. And the beehive is up in the rafters of the building, so it's built right into the building. And so they're protected under the roof, so the bears can't get to them. And uh, they can uh, fill up the house with honey. <laughs> so uh, what's the reason for all this? It's because we are a family, and we want to continue to be a family to um, have life continue. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I can answer any questions you might have. Some amazing energy moving around outside. Is it is it bringing in a storm that is that supposed to rain? Tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow. No. That's good for, we always need rain, huh? I know, first of all, that was fascinating. <laughs> Arranged, thank you. Um, I know with permaculture, there's a lot of non-native plants that are, you know, fruit trees and things like that. and. How do you approach that in your own, you know, permaculture, your own food forest? How do you seek to balance, or do you seek to balance um, some of the more traditional crops and plants? And, and do you know if there were um, sort of domesticated fruit trees that were used by the Santa Clara, Clara Pueblo or other Pueblo tribes? The the only fruit trees that we had were the wild plums. We had a wild canyon grape, but that doesn't produce very much grapes. So when I first started my uh, house permaculture site, we just found whatever plants could grow in that environment that would also 
be nitrogen fixers or produce some kind of food for us or the animals. And um, it was so barren that it was a matter of just get something to grow. <laughs> so once, you know, those, we planted actually a bunch of black locusts as one of the first little saplings. And uh, they became sort of the, the uh, gias, the mothers of the other plants. Once they grew, then they produced foliage and protection for other plants to grow in. Um, now I'm, you know, I'm aware of more local species that, um, if if you know if, if we plant those, they have an easier time growing because of the environment. But I tend to think if if it can grow there and, and manage, like for instance, uh, we have um, the gray water that comes out of the house in one uh, swell, and we actually planted some bamboo there. <laughs> and you know, in New Mexico, it's not, it doesn't spread fast, and it stayed these little whips for about 20 years. 20 years later, which is 20 generations, all of a sudden, this fatter one popped up. And then a few years later, uh, uh, you know, uh, inch size stalks started coming up. Now that whole little courtyard is full of um, these inch long bamboo that are wonderful to use for fencing and stuff like that. But I realized that, oh my gosh, it adapted. <laughs> and it took 20 years. And it, then we have New Mexico bamboo now. <laughs> varieties that are well adapted to your climate and your yeah. soils, like peaches and things? Yeah, one of the big things is Hopi peaches. And, and everyone talks about, oh, did you get some Hopi peaches? And I know those are drought tolerant peaches. So, yes. All right, any other questions? Yeah, in, in regards to um, the diet that um, you and many other people um, participated in over a three month period um, how did that um, how did that progress into I guess longer term um, diets was it adapted or did some people um, go back to eating the way that people were or was it has it did it um, kind of blend together um, some of the some of the uh, volunteers stuck to it hardcore for a couple of years, and then slowly it was sort of merged into other things that they brought in. Um, I think overall it was an incredible learning experience, and we all, the ones that did try it, um, have spread, you know, everyone looked at them and saw their health getting better, and people asked, how did you, how did you get better? And so they can, tell the story themselves of their own experience. And um, so we know that those foods um, are good for us. And so it's, it's brought a resurgent, resurgence of those particular foods. But it's still kind of mixed in right now with um, the Western food. And um, uh, I think that will be the case until we have to. <laughs> yeah. Hi, how are you? Good. Thanks for being with us today. I appreciate you. Thank talk. you. Very good. My name is David. In your experience, how have emerging technologies positively and negatively affected your food production? Um, negatively, right away, it distances us from our relationship to food. And I think that's the case with all of us, that the, the more we are disconnected from our food, um, the more we tend to choose and act away from nature. <laughs> and the more connected you are to your food, the more you, you know, act accordingly. If you have to raise your own, say, um, meat products, so call it meat products, but more you you raise an animal that you love and you care for and one day you have to take its life and you may have named it even and, um, and you're sitting there eating 
your pet <laughs> and crying about it, <laughs> um, you're not going to waste that meat or you're going to become a vegetarian. <laughs> you, you act differently when you're in relationship to your food. When you grow a tomato from scratch, that ripe tomato you finally, finally, you know, pick and cut so carefully, oh my gosh, it's a very different experience than buying a tomato at town and bringing it home for lunch. It's absolutely a, a totally different experience, and that's the difference. And, and so, the, you know, the high technology that, that supposedly is helping us, um, I would always ask, is it helping you main, with maintaining the relationship? Even if it's helpful, does it, does it break your relationship? Because the relationship is the most important part. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. So my question, the first one, I would like to find out, can you link me your work to the climate solutions? Climate solution is the greenhouse. <laughs> I, um, I, we're all in this boat together now of going, what are we gonna do as things get more drastic? Okay, because to me, cold. The climate now, the, the issue you are facing, you are the, the owner of it. You are, the pro, you, are, is, is, you are the one producing it. Because you are changing the way you are living, you are producing a lot of greenhouse gases. So this is leading to the climate global warming. So our parents, the, the way they are living to me is like they were friendly. It was environmental friendly. The way they are living, they were the friends of the nature. They are not destroying nature. So to me, I found something very nice in your presentation, like nature best solutions. Yes. Yeah. Like the way our parents, they were living. They're not destroying nature. It was very clean. Everything was good. You see all this problem you have cited, like the health issue, all these things, is because the way you have changed, the way you are living, to me really your work, is has a great contribution to the climate solutions. Yeah, if the way you, you see, if you want to keep a meat fridge, everything is fridge. Whatever you want to do, go to fridge. And our oh, parents there, they don't have fridge. And the life was very wonderful, very nice. They don't have any issue, heart attack, diseases, all those things, they don't have them. To me really, if, if you want to, fight some of the diseases, you have to go back to the way our parents, they were living. My second question is, today you are in the area where we take the young people, everything is social media, social media, online, online things. So I would like to find out what are the impacts of this, so if you take like American guy like my, my who has my age, you want to go back, it's going, it's, it's going to be very difficult to convince him to go to, to live <laughs> the way. Because people, they say, no, this you are out of model, is out of fashion. So you want to be, everything is online. So what are the implications of this social medias on what you are doing? Well, to the last question, you know, I've given the PFE uh, lecture many times and to all kinds of crowds of people from all different areas. And the coolest part is where people have tried this out for themselves, um, it's the same results. And um, it's, it's kind of like a journey, a self-awareness self journey of reconnecting to place. And um, uh, I can't tell you how deep it is because it's how far you want to go. It makes it as deep as you want it to be. Uh, I, had a, I had a woman from um, France who had been living in the States uh, get very excited over the talk because she said that, well, you know, I come to the States and I try to eat my uh, diet, which is mostly noodles, uh, wheat noodles, and um, I just blow it up. I feel very unhealthy and, and miserable. I go back to, to France, 
and I eat noodles for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I lose 20 pounds, and I'm really happy. And realize that the wheat was very different. The kinds of wheat grown there is different than the wheat grown here. So it could be that specific. I have a Māori friend who went back to New Zealand and um, ate their original uh, Māori foods, and same thing. It was very, you know, sea-based, but, um, but all of them talk about a journey, like what was there, you know, what were the foods there? And, and for, uh, obviously, we're, you know, we're very mixed at this time in history, so there's, there's even a deeper journey of going, well, gee, you know, I'm lactose intolerant, but I'm also eat sauerkraut, or I eat fish well, or I eat cactus, or you know, wherever it is you are originally from, it really, really does make a difference. Um, now I got lost track. <laughs> Did I answer the question? I don't. Social media. Yeah, yeah, it is hard to do all these things in, in today's world. It's very difficult. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our lifestyles are so far, but you don't have to like be over here all at once. You take steps. So maybe you cut out one thing or you try one thing and not another thing and see what it feels like because it really is sort of getting you in touch again with how your body feels. We, you know, we, we, we're so detached right now from the earth and our bodies that we just plow through everything. But to slow down to that extent to pay attention to what it feels like to eat a tomato and see what it feels like, to eat you know, cheese and see what it feels like, to notice those things and to research your history enough to know what were those foods that were in my area, 20 generations of not moving, um, those are your first clue. Those are your first list of foods to try. Um, and as close as you can fine tune that, the clearer your mud gets. Yeah. Roxanne, thank you so much. This has been inspiring about a thousand different directions. One of the things that I'm really struck by, and it's a little bit of an emerging thread in terms of my own pattern recognition across the different voices that we're hearing as part of the speaker series and some of the other um, cultural resources that members of the Arcosani community have been sharing with one another, is that this is the, the third time now in the last few months where in the course of an indigenous person talking about their food systems, in addition to all of the, the culture and tradition and history and recovery of all of those things, you, Michael Johnson, who was here a few weeks ago, um, and the other person I'm thinking of is Elsie Dubray, who's featured in a film called Gather. She's a high school student, but all three of you brought science into this equation, not just casual science, but actual data-driven science as a way to capture the fact that these aren't just anecdotal ideas. These aren't just somebody's family values. There's science beginning to show that everything that you're talking about is very, very, very real. And of course, science is something that the Western world <laughs> has used to validate its own ideas. So it's sort of a subversive use of science, almost. I'm wondering if there are other places in your work where you have engaged with the scientific way of capturing what you're doing in the same way that you were doing it with what the food was doing for the bodies and the health of the people following the diet. Thank you, that was, I, I agree. I think there's a tendency to want to do that, especially when you're coming from a culture that is spiritually driven. People were like, oh, yeah, that's woo-woo stuff. But it's like, no, it's for real. <laughs> you know, in your world of real. real. Um, uh, gosh, you know, just scientifically driven or I keep thinking I'm all caught up with soil right now and the context of how health is in the soil. 
and I haven't done any scientific measuring, but I'm really like looking into testing <laughs> the the nutrients or the the microbe of the of the soil to see uh, if treating it this way, what it looks like, versus treating it this way, what does it look like? And that's a kind of scientific method, but I haven't done it yet. But yeah. Any other questions? So I, I, I love what you're saying here. Um, I think you touched on it with the, we come from different backgrounds, like I have a German and an English background, and in my week and a half here at Arcasandi, I'm hanging with people from Italy and Colombia and all these other places, and that richness of the diversity of those other uh, other cultures makes, you know, it's really important to me in trying different foods and that. So how do you find that balance in, in you know, that experimenting in other diversities and yet kind of focusing on what's primal to you? Well, isn't it a matter of like knowing who you are and then visiting someone else? <laughs> so, so it's like instead of going, I can go anywhere and do whatever I want, that colonial mindset, to go, no, I, I'm going to be really centered in who I am and know me very well so that when I go visit something different or something other, I appreciate it as other and wonderfully um, unique in itself. But I can always then come back to me. And so you're not, you don't get lost in it. Um, you know, if, if you don't just have Chinese food available at any time <laughs> of the day or night, then when you have Chinese food, you want to know, wow, what is this? And how did you cook it? And why did you, where's this from? And it, I don't know, there's a respect that comes in that I think is lacking in the world right now, is that we, we can so of easily get anything we want and go anywhere we want and do anything we want. And ee, is lacking in respect. And I think when you kind of come back home <laughs> to yourself, then you, then you appreciate the differences. And then hopefully you, you demand respect back. It's like, no, don't just take my corn and use it however you want. These are our grandmothers. These are our dear grandmothers. Treat them like they're very, very wise elders. <laughs> And that's a cultural thing that is in every group of people there is. And, and wouldn't it be neat to like experience that, the world on that level, instead of, oh, I can get anything I want whenever I want. It, to, to come in with respect and say, who are you? What do you have? Who's your grandmothers? Wow. You know, it, it's not. <laughs> careless anymore. We, we walk carefully. We treat each other differently. We take care of each other differently. Yeah. So, so Kate made a good point about you using science for some of what you do. But what, one thing that really struck me is how you use art and design as well. <laughs> And to me, that seemed, you know, it's important to a place like Arcosanti. Some of the most interesting permaculture projects I've seen really incorporate not only plants, but, but that art and design component. And yeah. I'm guessing that, you know, you're doing that very consciously and that you feel like that probably contributes to that environment and maybe that health as well. I was just wondering if you could comment a little on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm an artist, so I'm very caught up with them. Um, Aesthetics, if you call it that. Um, but aesthetics, again, connected to place. Uh, so the patterns fit in with that. And the patterns that are, uh, I don't want to go use, you know, um, Maori patterns in my stuff, because that doesn't belong to us. But my patterns from my culture make sense to, to me. So that's a kind of an art or an aesthetics that is put into it. 
Um, I also think just, you know, back to the water crystals, that like when you um, make something with care and uh, love <laughs> uh, and, and your sense of beauty, it's going to, it's going to just radiate forever um, wonderful things. It's going to make the world a better place. So I really think art is medicine, and if uh, it's done with good intent, you can heal things through, through the energy that's put into to art. And art can be not just in an object, but in your food, in the buildings you build, in the clothes you wear, in every, every part of your world can be artistically uh, done, which puts in the good energy. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, thank you. Um, in, in regards to the comment about um, uh, like reconnecting 20 generations um, or 20 years, um, I was just wondering, like, is, is it about uh, going, like, Sorry, um, it, just like kind of defining um, the like the difference. Um, you know, 20 years. You were saying that the plant took uh, the bamboo took to take to the ground, and then um, like for us as humans, it takes 20 generations to go back to like truly understand who we who we are and like where we come from. Um, is there like a correlation to those two, with the 20 years and 20 generations? Yes, it's the 20 generations. For a, for a plant um, in a climate where you have winter and summer, um, where it goes into sleep in the winter, um, 20 years is 20 generations. For a human, that may be, you know, depends on how often you reproduce. <laughs> and um, I was figuring that the Spanish in New Mexico are almost at 20 generations. So they're almost adapted to New Mexico. But most of the European um, people have not reached 20 generations. So you're still uh, in limbo of sorts. It hasn't adapted. And then plus we move, you know, as people are saying, well, I lived in New York, now I live in LA, now I, you know, it's like, whoa, you have to start all over again now. <laughs> so it's like, like if you stayed put for 20 generations, then that 20 grandchild, child, 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 um, would fit that environment which is kind of crazy to think, but we're always trying to adapt. We're, we're, we're cockroaches, so we're, we're always trying to fit into place. And just when we got settled down and, and our gene starts to say, oh, okay, uh, it's really hot here, so I'm gonna produce more oil, you know, or I, I'm, I'm just gonna sweat more, and, you know, but, it's, but it doesn't quite get it, except your baby might have better adaption to uh, heat and then their baby will even be better. And then pretty soon down the line, you have a totally different looking person because it adapted. We are all different looking because of where we're from and because of the climate we're from. Whether we need to be hairier or not hairier, or darker skin or lighter skin, it's all about the genetics of place. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> it's like, so that's why I go, go backwards to when you can, when you know that your ancestors lived in one place for 20 generations or more, um, that food from that place is probably the best fit to your body that you can find. And you can find, you know, there's all these fancy diets everywhere, you know, lose weight, this one, blah, 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 blah. But <laughs> this is a new one. <laughs> it's about your genetics to place. So, um, yeah, that's a great presentation. And I'm, I'm assuming this is all your art that you've been showing? Yeah, that's, a, that's an old piece, a storyteller. It's really nice. <laughs> storyteller. Yeah. Thank you. So, 
I'm wondering about Greg's presentation this morning. He mentioned uh, the, his view of sustainability. Do you remember? Does everybody, anybody? That really kind of struck me, like, what's he talking about there? Um, and I've been thinking about that because a lot of times sustainability seems like this word that's overused in certain ways. Um, but Greg seemed to say that it was, I don't know, what, what, do, you, what do you think about the, that term, sustainability, and, and the way we use it all the time? Is it, is it the best word? I think it started out as a good word, <laughs> but I think it's gotten used to just run over the top of a lot of things. So you don't, everything I'm promoting is about the relationship, the, the connection to things. And I loved Greg's presentation just because it, to me it was like, like a real permaculture oriented presentation. And I thought, cool, it is what it is. It's a urban permaculture place um, he's coming from. And um, and he's moving and he's have to start over again. But <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> now he's got to do his 20 generations. <laughs> but but again, like the the connections are what I'm looking for always. And it's like, well, if you you know, wherever you go, whatever you can relate and connect to, is going to make the magic. <laughs> it, and so you know, I love his trying to connect all the dots stuff, which is to me relating, and his neighbors, you know, relating with him, and uh, those are all the, the connections that make us be uh, the basket that we are. And, you know, I don't like this past couple years where we're all on Zoom, <laughs> and we're all, it's one more piece of disconnection that makes it hard in some ways, but I, I am always encouraging, it's like, well, go outside and pet your dog more. <laughs> you know, go grow something, anything, because your relationship to that plant will make you that much more part of what makes sustainability really real. And the regenerative part is, I think, a better word, because the sustainable is like, well, what does that mean? You know, people have made it into a very, easy, easy word, but the regenerative word feels more reciprocal. It feels more like, no, you, again, let's break it down, break it down, breathe in, breathe out. You know, you, you, everything is, you know, you're taking in whatever you take in and you're letting out whatever you let out. Now, what is that? What are you doing with your life? What are you taking in? You could like walk through the most amazing place and not see anything. That means you didn't breathe in very much. <laughs> you could like, you know, be really greedy and, <laughs> and then blow it up and then pop. <laughs> and then that doesn't help anything. Uh, it's, it's like, what are you, how are you breathing in and out? Because if you're alive, you are breathing in and out. So. How are you going to breathe in and out? How much of it are you going to take in? I always sometimes think, damn, if I become even a, a fuller human being, then the world becomes richer and richer. And that means I breathe in more of it. That means just walking down the street is like, oh, it's not nothing anymore. So it's all the relationship of our connection to things, which is the breathing in, and what we then choose to do with it. What we do with it inside. Take it in, do we just go <laughs> Or do we <laughs> make it matter? Like, wow, that was a good breath. 